So good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the November uh, webinar of the EZE Papers of the Month, and we have tonight two very exciting papers to uh, present. My name is uh, Peter Siersma. My co-chair is Helmut Messman. However, uh, Helmut is still in the plane on his way to, uh, to Dublin to prepare for EZ Days 2023. So most, like, most likely I will be here uh, uh, on my own being the chair of this session. We have uh, four uh, excellent speakers, uh, uh, two speakers that will present the paper and also two speakers that will uh, comment on the paper. One paper is related to uh, uh, artificial intelligence, characterization of lesions and its role in diminutive or in, in its role in discard and the, in the uh, resect and discard strategy. And uh, the other paper is uh, the paper that everyone is discussing um, uh, at, this, at this time, and that's the paper that was published in, uh, uh, in New, England of Journal, New England Journal of Medicine and was also presented during the UOG, uh, UOG week and will be presented by Michael Brethauer and uh, commented by, by uh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo Jover. Well, very exciting to, uh, to, uh, to start with this. Um, of course, uh, very welcome. Um, there are already many participants in, in this webinar. And please, uh, if you have any questions, there's the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, uh, the, the, please use it. And uh, if you have any questions, we will try to discuss them at the uh, end of the presentations. Well, then first I will introduce, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Emanuela Rondondotti. Uh, he uh, performed a multi-center study on uh, artificial intelligence-assisted intelligence optical diagnosis for the resect and discard strategy in clinical practice, the, the AVC study. Uh, Emanuela, I'm very honored that you are here tonight. Please present your paper. Dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Sirsema for the kind invitation to discuss with you tonight the results of our paper entitled Artificial Intelligence Assisted Optical Diagnosis for Resect and Discard Strategy in Clinical Practice. Here there are my disclosures. The implementation of clinical strategies based on optical diagnosis of diminutive colorectal polyps may lead to substantial economic savings. However, optical diagnosis is perceived by endoscopists as a difficult task it is an operator-dependent process, and accuracy values reported in the community setting are highly variable across endoscopists, and frequently they fall below the safety thresholds proposed for their incorporation in clinical practice by scientific societies. In this setting, the use of an AI automatic image analysis computerized system, the so-called CADEX system, has the potential to facilitate the endoscopist evaluation, making the optical characterization, namely the distinction between neoplastic and non-neoplastic polyps, easy, quick, more reliable, and also more objective. Our study was primarily aimed at prospectively evaluating whether the endoscopist, assisted by a new CADIX system, could achieve the PV safety thresholds proposed by ASG for the evaluation of diminutive rectosigmoid polyps. We also evaluated performances according to the endoscopist expertise in optical characterization. 18 endoscopists, half of them were experts in optical characterization from five Italian centers, participated in the present study. Consecutive patients refer for colonoscopy for mixed indication in whom at least one diminutive rectosigmoid polyp was identified during the procedure were included. We plan to collect at least 235 diminutive rectosigmoid adenomas. We perform a step-by-step -step study. When a diminutive rectosigmoid poly was identified during a standard white light colonoscopy, the blue light was switched on and the endoscopist made its own polyp characterization by categorizing the polyp as an adenoma or a non-adenoma. Then the CADEX system was activated. The CADEX provided its own output, which was also recorded as adenoma or non-adenoma. And finally, the endoscopist combining its own initial evaluation and the CADEX output provided final polyp evaluation again, classifying the polyp as adenomatous or non-adenomatous. 
This is the so-called AI-assisted combined evaluation, which was compared with the pathology result, which was the reference standard in the current study. This is the system we use for polyp characterization in our study. As you can see here, the system has a color code. When the dot in the heat map is yellow, the polyp is characterized as an adenoma. Conversely, when the dot is green, the AI classifies the polyp as a non-adenoma. The outcome was collected only when provided by the system, when technically reliable and stable over time. So optical diagnosis by AI was visible in 91% of all identified diminutive rectosigmoid polyps. Overall, we included in our study 596 rectosigmoid polyps, 43% of them were adenomas. Our data show that in a clinical practice setting, the AI-assisted optical characterization was effective in reaching required thresholds. Since the negative predictive value combining endoscopist and CADEX evaluation was over 90%, which is the threshold settled by ASGE for implementation in clinical practice of living strategy as far as diminutive rectosigmoid polyp are concerned. The design of our study give us the unique opportunity to compare the performance of the endoscopist alone before activating AI and the performances obtained after activation of AI. As you can see here, looking at the endoscopist performances before activating AI, we found that the negative predictive value for adenomatous histology of diminutive rectus sigmoid poly was already over 90%. Thus, putting into question the actual contribution of CADEX in the optical diagnostic process. And also sensitivity, specificity, overall accuracy were similar before using AI and after the AI activation. Interestingly, these data are closely similar to those recently published by Maury and colleagues on New England Journal, and also by Hassan and colleagues, both of them using completely different CADEX system. However, these results were not completely unexpected in our study, since uh, we included both experts and non-experts. And in our study, two-thirds of diminutive rectosigmoid polyps were evaluated by experts. And experts tend to have a better performance profile for all parameters when compared with non-experts. But the good news is that when focusing on non-experts, our exploratory analysis showed that the trend in terms of negative predictive value and accuracy is quite good. By increasing quickly over time, we observe a relatively short learning curve for non-expert endoscopists who quickly approach expert performances over time, as reported here in this graph, as far as accuracy is concerned. Last but not least, AI-assisted polyp characterization allowed to set a correct post polypectomy surveillance interval in more than 90% of cases, according to both ESG and US guidelines. Dear colleague, in conclusion, according to our data, real-time CADEX assisted optical diagnosis appears to be feasible in clinical practice, matching both PV thresholds. In the optical diagnostic process, the additional benefit of CADEX system appears to be marginal for experts, but it might help known experts to meet clinically relevant thresholds. Further larger study, mostly involving known experts and combining CAD system for both detection and characterization are expected in the near future. Many thanks for your kind attention. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuji Mori. Uh, it is my great pleasure to join this reviewing process of this amazing event provided by ESGE. Peter and Helmut, thank you very much for having me here. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate Emmanuel for his achievement because this piece, this paper is one of the most amazing papers in this year uh, because it provides a lot of things, including the uh, insights on AI, understanding on its clinical practice use, and also the uh, 
challenges that we should think about later. So just I want to summarize the study design and the primary end point of this study in this slide. The study design, this is a prospective not centered non-randomized controlled trial. And then the authors evaluated one intervention, which is the computer edit diagnosis assisted optical biopsy. So this can be said CAT X assisted optical biopsy instead. And they have included roughly 1,100 patients, and they examined the one primary endpoint, which is the negative predictive value or NPV to identify diminutive adenomas in rictimal portion, uh, which is exactly the same as the PV1 criteria, which was proposed by Doug Rex in 2011. And if you look at the results of the primary endpoint, MPV was proved to be 91%. So I'm not quite sure if this is a positive study or a negative study in terms of the uh, primary endpoint because the 95% confidence in trouble of this value crosses over 90%. But still, this is a really important study, I would say. So let us just focus on its significance and possible limitation. So first of all, we'll uh, when it comes to the novelty, this study is quite new and novel because this is the first one to assess if CATX helps endoscopists achieve the PV threshold in optical biopsy. Definitely, this is the only one that provides this kind of information so far. So in this regard, uh, there is some clinical relevance because endoscopists can understand if CATX contributes to high quality optical biopsy in their clinical practice. Apparently, this study was done in community-based clinical uh, uh, hospitals, and the results can be transferable to the clinical practice. This is actually the, definitely the strength of this study. But of course, all the studies have some limitations. Also, this applies to this study. So one of the biggest limitations is that this study was not powered to identify the added value of using CATX. So we don't know uh, uh, how the AI can increase or decrease the performance of endoscopies, honestly speaking. Uh, but apart from that, uh, uh, authors did some sub-analysis to challenge this point. Uh, this is the kind of table which was presented by Emmanuel in, in the previous presentation. This is very interesting data because we are not able to identify any added value in terms of sensitivity, specificity, or even NPV or accuracy. Uh, but apparently, we should not discuss this matter uh, from the statistical point of view because of the lack of the power, and this is not a primary endpoint. But still, it's very interesting to discuss if the use of AI can increase the value of optical diagnosis in clinical practice. To further dive, dive into this topic, we may see the previous papers. Actually, there are roughly three comparative prospective studies which have been published in the scientific journals. Uh, one is apparently uh, Rodonanti's uh, paper, Emmanuel's paper, which was just presented by him. And also we have two other papers, uh, one from our team and the other one is from uh, Cezale or Professor Hassan. Uh, I just want to uh, show some of the results from our study as a comparison. So this is the kind of the core result of our study, which was published in NAGM evidence this year. As you can see in this bar graph, uh, there was uh, no statistical difference in terms of sensitivity between the uh, standard colonoscopy procedure and the AI assisted colonoscopy procedure. But in this study, we observed a lot of difference in terms of the proportion of high confidence diagnosis. Uh, in this regard, probably AI can contribute to the increment of the optical diagnosis in clinical practice uh, because basically we are allowed to do optical diagnosis only under the high confidence in uh, uh, prediction. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to cast one or two questions to uh, Emmanuel. The first one is very general one. 
Do you recommend the use of CALEX in colonoscopy based on the results of this paper? And the second question is something a little bit difficult to ask, but uh, uh, I'm wondering if we need a randomized controlled trial or a different kinds of trial to further clarify the benefits and harms of using CALEX in colonoscopy. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much for this uh, presentation, uh, both Emmanuel and also Yuji. Uh, a very clear presentation of the paper pre uh, that was published in Endoscopy, and also, I think, uh, very valuable comments made by uh, Yuji. I think we first uh, should focus, uh, well, maybe before we continue, I, would, uh, I should say also hello to, uh, uh, to the participants that uh, joined during the presentation. And once again, if you have any questions related to this presentation or related to the comments, please use the Q&A box and we will uh, we will discuss these questions uh, also in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, let's go to the first question, uh, Yugi. Uh, uh, Emanuela, do you recommend the use of CADEX in colonoscopy already? Or? Thank you. Thank you for uh, Yugi for his commentary and thank you for this question. According to our data, in my opinion, CADEX should be used in clinical practice only where there is an expertise already in optical diagnosis. Having in mind that it seems to me that the CADEX is mostly useful for evaluation of rectus sigmoid polyp, particularly when those are clearly appearing as an hyperplastic polyp. I have to say that the using CADEX together with our own evaluation, we can increase our level of confidence and sometimes this makes uh, our evaluation much more reliable. So I think that it's a valuable help for polyp characterization, particularly when we are speaking about diminutive rectus sigmoid polyp. Anyway, we have to take in mind that at present time, we are dealing with the first generation of AI systems, and those systems are computer machine, and that we can expect that they can be easily improved quickly implementing uh, new images, new databases. So it is reasonable for me to see new generation of AI in the near future with even better performances. So we can expect that this scenario may change completely in the near future. And we can have many uh, much more reliable output from the system. In that case, it would be really helpful in clinical practice. Well, thank you for that. Um, my, my question would then be, uh, you were also speaking about experts and non-experts. Uh, what is the difference between experts and non-experts? Uh? The performances of experts was already quite closely to that of AI, while at, the, at, at least at the beginning of their, uh, of their practice, the performance of non-experts was quite uh, lower compared to that of AI. And another difference is that when the AI is in keeping with the initial evaluation of non-expert, they tend to increase their level of confidence. So this can be also helpful in reassuring the uh, complementary uh, uh, usefulness of those kinds of systems for non-experts. And we also can think about the fact that uh, probably in the near future with more reliable AI machines, that would be also useful for training for non-experts. And you said specifically that uh, this is uh, this is a tool that is important for the rectum and the sigmoid. Yes. And, and why not for the more proximal part of the colon? Because uh, there are conflicting data about that. Our study is quite reassuring because if you compare results from proximal and distal polyps, performances of AI, performances of endoscopies are quite similar. But there are other studies, another one from, uh, from uh, um, other groups, um, and particularly the first one from Yuichi, which are showing a differences in terms of performances as far as proximal and distal polyps are concerned. So uh, I would say data seems to be robust when we speak about distal polyps, but there are conflicting data when we are speaking about proximal. So in, in my mind, it seems to be much more suitable for a living strategy instead of for resect and discard, generally speaking. So, Yuji, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I totally agree with your idea, Emmanuel. I think we have a lot of challenges uh, in terms of optical biopsy in proximal column because of the presence of SSL, 
which is already commented in the chat box. Uh, so I guess, I think we should prioritize the introduction of CADEX firstly in Rexy mod. And after we overcome the program, problem of SSL in terms of octet biopsy, we are able to introduce CADEX to this area. That's my understanding. So there's a question from the audience, and, um, and that question is as follows. Can you talk about AI and SSL in your study? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, as for uh, many other studies, the number of SSL in the rectal sigmoid less than five millimeters is so slow, so small that we encountered very few of those polyps. So finally, compared to the high number of hyperplastic polyp and of uh, adenomas, uh, SSL does not represent a large, a significant issue when we are focusing on rectal sigmoid and on diminutive polyp. I completely agree with you, Ichi. When we are on the right side, speaking about even a little bit larger polyps, the issue of SSL is a key issue, but not for a diminutive rectal sigmoid polyp. We encountered very, very few of those in our study. I have to say that the system we use tends to classify those polyps as hyperplastic. Probably thinking about the right side, it will be much more safer to uh, characterize those polyps as an adenomas instead of hyperplastic. That's a matter of output of the machine, but on the right side, it, I would treat those polyps much more as adenomas instead of treating them as hyperplastic. While in the left side, I think that we can treat SSL less than five millimeters as hyperplastic polyp instead of uh, adenomas. So, and, and did you switch on your, your uh, machine um, only when you entered the, the sigmoid or was it on for the whole, for the whole uh, colon? We did it in our study, we did for all the colon, for all the diminutive polyps. So we were able to compare results from right side to the left side. And is that also what we do in clinical practice? But I have to say that I rely on the output of the machine and I apply living, uh, living situ strategy only on the right, on the left side, sorry. Uh, while I'm interested to see what the machine is saying about uh, the histology in the right side, but I don't rely on that output uh, as I have. Uh, when I, I have to manage the polyp uh, on the right side. And you were discussing the difference between experts and non-experts, but there are also differences between centers? Um, yes, a bit, but uh, um, the number of polyps was, was quite comparable between, uh, among centers, and we didn't find so much differences across centers, even because in each center there was a, simi there was a similar number of experts and non-experts in each center, so the results were quite comparable. Okay, so let's then go to the second question that was raised by uh, Yuji. Um, do we need a randomized trial to further clarify the benefits and harms of using CADEX? I agree with that uh, suggestion. I think that randomized control trials are crucial to finally evaluate not only the performances of CADEX itself, but the effectiveness of the entire strategy based on CADEX. And another point I have to raise here is the fact that we need also studies evaluating costs and cost effectiveness, because we have to remember that both living in situ and resecting this car strategy has been suggested in order to uh, save resources, to reduce costs, uh, to better manage polyps. So finally, we also have to check exactly in clinical practice using different systems, uh, at the cost effectiveness, pointing uh, uh, our attention on costs and, and spending of resources by using those kind of systems. So, yeah, Yujib, please. Yeah, oh, thanks. So, Emmanuel, I have uh, two questions or, or two comments. I agree with you uh, uh, with your perspective on the importance of cost effectiveness analysis, uh, primarily because of the, uh, I would say, non smooth introduction or implementation of AI due to the lack of the reimbursement. And the reimbursement needs kind of data of, from the financial perspective. So it definitely we do need this kind of data. And a second comment or question is about the learning curve of the trainees in terms of octa biopsy in your study. I just want to uh, uh, ask one question regarding this matter. So what kind of learning curve did you observe in this study? Is it about a baseline colonoscopy performance or optical biopsy performance, or 
AI assisted cognoscopy performance of the trainees. This is a quite important point from the training perspective. Uh, starting from the, your first comment, I agree completely uh, with you, with your, uh, with, with your view about that. Cost effective is important, also from a legal point of view, because finally, uh, now we are using a system which is not uh, really uh, undergoing any kind of a specific evaluation from a legal point of view. And the other point is about the learning curve. The learning curve we measured in our study was the AI-assisted optical diagnosis. So it was the final step, including both evaluation of, uh, of the endoscopist and the evaluation of the machine. But uh, we also measure the performances of uh, younger endoscopists, sorry, of non-experts, uh, by using uh, their own eyes without AI. And we also, what we, uh, we see there, uh, it's not reported in the study because of the length of, of the paper, but we also see an improvement in optical diagnosis itself without AI. So I mean, it means that using AI tends to focus your attention on the specific topic, on the, uh, on the features of the polyp, and you improve your performances also without using AI by, by using AI. It means that this is a, probably a good tool for improving, generally speaking, optical diagnosis performances of endoscopists. I think that's a great finding, which can be a, a, another paper. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So my, my final question would be, at, at what stage of, um, of, of the trainee, uh, his, his career, well, should, should he start with, uh, with uh, CADX? I mean, should it be from the beginning or... Is there that you say, well, maybe he should have done 100 or 200 colonoscopies? Is, is there any, any rule there? Absolutely not at, at the present time, but uh, just a personal opinion. Uh, I think that uh, to maximize your capabilities and also to maximize your learning curve by using AI, I think you have to already be able to do your own evaluation by uh, your uh, your own uh, eyes uh, and uh, by applying uh, classifications we already know from MBI, from uh, BLI, and uh, for all, all the systems we have. So I think that having a, a, a short experience in optical diagnosis before using AI can make the AI much more contributable and can shorten the, the, the further learning, learning curve for non-experts. Okay, well, then a, a short question from the audience. That's the final question. Uh, do you use magnifying um, uh, endoscopy when you're using AI? Is it needed sorry, to I, use magnifying keep, uh, endoscopy? Sorry. No, uh, we performed our study without magnification uh, because that's the standard we decided to use because it's, apply, uh, it's applicable for many other centers because uh, magnification requires a specific and dedicated endoscopes. And uh, we performed our study without magnification, but we expect that combining magnification with AI, we can achieve even better results. The another reason why we use, we didn't use magnification at time of our study was because the machine has been trained without magnification images. So uh, the machine has been specifically trained without magnification images. So that's the reason why we decided to stay close to the way in which the machine has been originally trained. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for, present, for presenting this paper that was published in Endoscopy. And Yuji, Yuji a very, very many thanks for, for the comments and also for the discussion related to this, uh, to this paper. We move on to, this, to the second paper, the last paper of this, uh, of this webinar. Uh, this second paper will be presented by Mike, Michael Bretthauer with uh, well, a, a group of co-authors. The uh, paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the title of the paper is Effect of Colonoscopy Screening on Risk of Colorectal Cancer and Related Death. And afterwards, the paper will be commented by um, Rodrigo Jover, who will unfortunately not be here because he is also in the plane uh, on his way back uh, to home, I think. Uh, so we will do the discussion only uh, uh, with his uh, comments. And together, uh, Michael and I will discuss this paper at the end of this session. And of course, if you have any questions in the audience, please, again, uh, submit them in the Q&A box, and we will try to discuss them all. Uh, but first of all, I'd like uh, to give the floor to, uh, to Michael to present uh, this exciting paper, uh, this recently published paper in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I will here present to you the 10 year analysis of the Nordic trial, the Nordic European Initiative on Colorectal Cancer, which uh, measures the effect of colonoscopy screening on colorectal cancer incidence and colorectal cancer mortality after 10 years. This paper was published in the New England Journal on October 9th of this year. The Nordic trial, ladies and gentlemen, is a randomized population-based trial which played out in four countries, Norway, Poland, Sweden, and the Netherlands. 95,000 healthy individuals uh, between 55 and 64 years were randomized to either invitation to one colonoscopy screening or to no screening at all, which was what was offered in the trial areas during the trial. The randomization was directly from the population registries. That means that all the people who were living in the cities where the trial was playing out was randomized, either to colonoscopy screening or to just live their lives without any intervention. The primary endpoints of the trial were CLC uh, incidents and mortality after 10 to 15 years, and this paper deals with the 10 year results. Also, as a secondary endpoint, we measured all course mortality. For the current analysis, we were able only to retrieve data from three out of the four countries, Norway, Poland, and Sweden, which left us with 85,000 individuals who were randomized in a one to two fashion, one third to colonoscopy, 28,000 people, and two thirds to no screening, about 56,000 people. Here I show you the baseline characteristics of the trial. As you can see, most of the participants came from Poland and Norway and only very few from Sweden. With regard to screening participation, 42% overall um, of the people who were randomized to receive an invitation actually came and underwent a colonoscopy. The uh, participation rate was uh, very high in Norway, 60.7% and lower in the other two countries. With regard to screening performance, as you can see, the screening was performed very well with a very good quality of the bowel preparation with good or very good uh, uh, preparation scores in 90% 90, 90 of the individuals, a high sequence intubation rate and a high adenoma detection rate. Now, with regard to adverse events, we had no perforations. We had a couple of bleedings. As expected, all of them were managed endoscopically. Importantly, uh, for the results that I will show you in a second, the contamination, which is the screening rate, the colonoscopy screening rate, or any other screening for colorectal cancer was very low amongst the people who were randomized to no screening below 2%. I will now show you uh, the primary endpoint analysis, which was colorectal cancer incidence after 10 years in the intention to treat analysis. So everybody who was randomized to one group as compared to the other group, as you can see, indicated here uh, the risk of colorectal cancer in the usual care group. So the people who were not offered any screening was 1.2% after five years as compared to 0.98% in the people who were offered screening, which gives you an absolute and a relative risk reduction of 18% with a relative risk of 0.82. Now, because we did not have a perfect participation, as you would expect. Not everybody who was invited to colonoscopy attended the colonoscopy. We, own, we also did so-called per protocol analysis where we only compare the patients who actually received a colonoscopy uh, with the control group. Here again, the risk in the usual care group is 1.2%. And now in the people who actually were screened, it goes down to 0.84%, which gives you a relative risk reduction of 31%. What are the data for mortality? Here is the intention to treat analysis. No difference between the two groups. A relative risk of um, 0.9, not statistically significant. So in the intention to treat analysis, no difference between the people who were invited as compared to the people who were not invited. If you then go to do the pair protocol analysis, you can see that the risk reduction, and this is depending on the method for the pair protocol analysis. We did two different methods. Pair protocol analysis, as most of you know, it's, an, it's, an, it's a tricky business. You have to control for a lot of confounding variables. 
the risk reduction we estimated uh, for mortality was between 28 and 50 percent reduction. What about screening participation and benefits? As you can see, very different participation rate in the two countries uh, which contributed the most participants, 60 percent in Norway, 30 percent in Poland. The intention to treat uh, effects of colonoscopy screening are similar in the two countries. However, the per protocol where you me measure only the people who attended, the higher the effect is higher in Norway as compared to Poland. So that leads us to conclusions that are as follows. Uh, according to our trial, colonoscopy screening reduces colorectal cancer incidence uh, by something uh, 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 from 18 to 31 percent, depending on what analysis you believe uh, uh, mostly in, and an absolute lumbus that will be from 1.2 to 0.9 percent absolute risk. With regard to colorectal cancer death, first of all, it needs to be acknowledged that risk were very low, only 0.3% of the people in the control group uh, died of colorectal cancer over the 10 years. And if you believe the per protocol analysis and you take the highest estimate, this risk may be reduced to 0.15%. With regard to the secondary endpoint, all cost mortality, I did not show you the numbers, but they are on this slide. There was no difference between the two groups, so no effect of colonoscopy screening on all cause mortality. Thank you so much for your attention. Hi, I would like first of all to thank ESD and Peter Sirsema and Helmut for inviting me for, uh, to this nice uh, discussion about this wonderful study with my friend Michael Berthaupt. I don't have disclosures regarding this talk, I would like to start with the strengths and weaknesses of this uh, study. Strengths are a lot. This is the first comparative study evaluating the role of colonoscopy in colorectal cancer screening. So this is the, the study that everyone was waiting for. And I would like also to say that this is a study that it's, will be very difficult to repeat because screening is everywhere now and it's difficult to find an unusual care group that will not receive screening. Uh, the study includes a large sam sample of participants and it is very nice the pragmatic design that is close to the real screening program. And finally, the study has a very rigorous clinical and statistical analysis. But the study has also some weaknesses. I'm, I'm worried about the potential effect of contamination with, with the screening. The study was conducted between 2009 and 2014, and the follow-up has been until uh, recently, and during this time, screening program has increased a lot all over Europe, especially in Poland and Norway. Uh, and uh, it, it, the, the authors say that there is no effect of contamination in the study, but they don't provide any number. We don't know which is the number of colonoscopies, for instance, in the usual care group. Also, the results have been are counterintuitive. Uh, for example, the results in, in colorectal cancer uh, incidence reduction and, and mortality and worse than that, uh, hugely uh, published with sigmoidoscopy. And the, the result is that someone is wrong. The studies with sigmoidoscopy are wrong, or this study is wrong because both are very difficult to combine. Uh, some people have blamed the low participation for the for the results of this study, but I don't think the participation is low. I think participation higher than 40% with colonoscopy, with primary screen colonoscopy is not a low participation. It is, it is a good participation in, in, in people that are invited for screening. And also there is a lack of analysis of differences between participants and non-participants in the colonoscopy arm. Perhaps healthier persons are the participants and the risk of colorectal cancer, the population of high, the higher risk of colorectal cancer are the people that don't participate, uh, that would change the, the results. And also, perhaps it's too early to analyze mortality. We have seen other randomized control trial that the, the preliminary results are different than the final results. And probably <coughs> the last word war will come with longer follow-up. And finally, there is no uh, 
beta analysis about quality of colonoscopy and its potential influence on the results of this study. This is the work before the Nordic study. Uh, in this nice review uh, from Yuri Ladbaum and other authors, uh, they explain the, the reduction in colorectal cancer incidence and mortality achieved by different screening methods. This is the stool based test with this uh, reduction, especially in colorectal cancer mortality. Regarding sigmoidoscopy, in the intention to treat the study, the reduction in colorectal cancer incidence is around 27% and around 30% in the per protocol uh, uh, analysis. Uh, regarding reduction in colorectal cancer mortality, the intention to treat uh, is 21% and the per protocol analysis between 38 and 43% reduction of colorectal cancer mortality. And until now, the only results we had about the efficacy of colonoscopy are coming from observational studies. Uh, and they uh, predict an effect in the reduction of colorectal cancer incidence around 50% and even higher in colorectal cancer, uh, even higher reduction in colorectal cancer mortality. So that has been changed with the Nordic study. Uh, for example, in this uh, meta-analysis conducted by the same authors and the Nordic study in sigmoidoscopy, they uh, found a colorectal cancer incident reduction of 21% and a reduction in colorectal cancer mortality of 27%, and that has been changed in the Nordic study. Only finding for the, with the colonoscopy, but a, a more complete study of the colon and, and all the audience knows, a colorectal cancer incidence of only 18% and mortality of only 10%. So everything is different and, and the, these results has been uh, largely unexpected. Regarding comparison between different tests, uh, there are several ongoing studies, there are three ongoing studies. I would like to talk about the Spanish one, the colon prep study, comparing fit versus colonoscopy, that, and, and these studies will uh, declare will who will be the winner in this in this race in for for instance in this study we can see how only one round of feet has the same uh, efficacy in uh, in cancer detection and a little bit smaller efficacy in the detection of advanced adenomas so we are waiting for the final result of this study probably with column previous study we have some we will have some news next year so finally i would like to raise some questions to uh, michael in this discussion so thank you very much uh, Michael and also Rodrigo, who uh, unfortunately cannot be here, and the same is true for uh, for uh, Helmut. I I thought I saw him for a second, but uh, he left again, so he's not here. And well, we do we will do it without uh, without Helmut, and that is uh, I think perfectly possible because there's not a paper that has that has caused more discussion in in the last few uh, well weeks, maybe months, than your paper, Michael. Uh, so you must be, you must have been very busy, I think, uh, answering all the questions and all the uh, maybe also the the the, uh, the the critics that have come. So uh, what happened to your life in the last few weeks? It has been fun, Peter. I mean, it's always uh, it's always nice when people recognize and acknowledge and discuss what you do. I think this is uh, beautiful. And of course, some people are critical. Some people love it a lot, and some people think they. Uh, they that's what always they have been expecting but 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 i think the overall the overall uh, impression is that it is good that this is out and that it is discussed out there among among people i like it well that's uh, what i very much can understand and i think it's that's it's all it's also the topic that uh, uh, but that's important for, for people and uh, because we all well become 50 55 at one at one stage and then this has happened to all of us, and uh, and that also causes uh, enthusiasm, uh, maybe criticism, maybe fear, whatever you can call it. But yeah, uh, let's go to the questions uh, that we have. Uh, and the first question that is uh, uh, that it is hard to believe that there is no effect of contamination. Uh, but what what is your feedback here? 
Yeah, and let me let me first say thanks to Rodrigo. It's a pity that he cannot be here. I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. I really appreciate his um, his uh, comments on the study. He's uh, he was spot on, and I also like that he put this into perspective. The contamination. Well, I I understand that it's hard to believe. Let me just go back. You know, ten plus years, Peter. Um, when we when we designed the study and when we traveled around and I did a lot of that traveling across Europe to engage centers and people and countries into the country. The situation was almost the opposite. People, a lot of people were saying, you are crazy to offer colonoscopy to the general population. Nobody will come. You cannot do this. It's dangerous and the effect is questionable. So, so, so at the time, the worry was nobody will come. Now, Nobody believes us that the control group was really unexamined. So it's funny how things can change just in 10 or 12 years. Um, I can only tell you what I, what I said in my talk. We measured compliance. We measured uh, contamination by, by two, in two ways in Poland. And we, did, we don't have that in the paper because it was difficult to put in because of the word limit. We have one reference in the paper when we say the contamination was low. There was a Norwegian registry that we have been having for 15 years where we, ex where we measure the indications for all colonoscopy that are done in Norway. And we have been seeing there that the indications for screening colonoscopy amongst the people in the regions that were not invited was very low and it was not increasing over, uh, over the 10 years. It was below 2%. So that's the indication that we are having. We were also measuring the number of colonoscopies that were done in the areas, and they were not increasing more than in other areas. It's always increasing a little bit because of clinical indications, but the indication for screening was not going up. The general number of colonoscopy was not going up. There was no way. In Poland, we are so fortunate to have Michael Kaminski in the, the Nordic group, who is also leading actually all cancer screening programs in Poland. He knows, Michael and his team, they know when somebody goes to a screening colonoscopy in Poland. Um, and what they, be, what they were able to do is measure how many people in the control group who actually received a colonoscopy, again, below 2%. So that's what we measured and that's what we reported. It's funny that you're mentioning uh, Michael Kominski because when uh, what, what you showed was also, or that I think Rodrigo showed that, that there was also a difference in participation rate between Norway and Poland. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, that, and yeah, go ahead. Please, no, please. I, I think you will say you will answer my question already before I ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not problem. Yeah, participation was lower as I as I said in the talk in in Poland. Also in Sweden, it was lower than Norway. So I think probably Norway is the outlier. We expected that a little bit. We hoped that it would have been a little higher in Poland than it actually was, 33%. But we expected higher in Norway because we have seen from sigmoidoscopy trials that people are very compliant um, in clinical trials in general in Norway. So when you ask people to participate in the clinical trial, they generally say yes. And that is also that has also been the case in this trial. I think people have a lot of trust up here. And when people are asking, when researchers are asking, uh, people usually say yes. I think it's a pattern in the country. Right. Let's let's move on to the to the next question. Uh, what was the CRC incidence in the usual care group? Was it the same uh, as expected? Yeah. Very good question again by Rodrigo. Yes, it was about what we had expected. So the 1.2 percent over 10 years, it was a little lower, but not 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 a lot lower than what we expected. However the mortality was a lot lower than we expected. In other words, the case fatality, the survival of patients with colorectal cancer, so the, the percentage of the people who have colorectal cancer and then die is now a lot smaller than when we designed the trial 15 years ago, which, which perfectly fits with with what everybody else is observing. You know, oncological treatment is better. Surgical treatment, at least for rectal cancer, is a lot better. Um, so mortality was lower in both groups than we had expected. Yes, that makes sense, of course. All these developments have, uh, have had a positive effect on uh, mortality, yeah. Do you expect a better effect on mortality and incidence after longer follow-up? 
Uh, very, again, a very good question. I, you know, obviously, and we have discussed this in the group ever since we had had the results internally. Um, maybe, maybe um, we think you know it takes longer time to observe mortality effects than incidence effects with a tool like colonoscopy. So maybe at least for mortality incidence, we not quite sure. Uh, we certainly hope so that that the effects are getting a little larger, but nobody knows. With regard to mortality, and you know, Peter, when when you come down to so low numbers, uh, so to so low risk, zero point three percent in the control group, yeah, it's very hard. You know, it's very hard to 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 make the claim that anything that goes lower from zero point three is something that is clinically interesting for for people. So I think that's one of the major struggles, if you will, with our screening that the oncologists. Are, and the searches also are so good now that it's really hard to show anything because we are so close to zero down there. That's a, be a struggle for us in the future. Will be a struggle for the Spanish trial that Rodrigo mentioned for any trial in screen. Yeah, that's true. Um, how do you explain the effects of that the effects of colonoscopy were worse than uh, sigmoidoscopy? Yeah, again, a very good question, and again, something that we have discussed a lot internally. As Rodrigo said, it, 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 it may seem a little unbelievable that, you know, the sigmoidoscopy screening would be as effective as colonoscopy screening. That is not something that we and, and all of the field has expected. On the other hand, we have to remember why sigmoidoscopy was introduced in the first place and how it was introduced. In, you know, in the randomized trials, but also in the few countries or, or regions that have done it. Sigmoidoscopy is triage screening, a lot like fecal screening, fecal testing. So you first screen people with a sigmoidoscopy, but then all the people who have some kind of lesion, and it's a little bit different where the cutoff is, just as for, as for fit, you know, some trials have said any polyps, some tr other trials have said any adenoma. One trial has said uh, adenomas uh, larger than 10 millimeters. So in other words, the people with the highest risk in the sigmoidoscopy screening trials then go on to colonoscopy. And, and, and the reasoning was that, well, these are the people with the highest risk, so with the highest risk of having something higher up. Uh, and between four and 20% in the sigmoidoscopy trials, received a colonoscopy and the effects of the sigmoidoscopy screening trials is the combination of everybody having a sigmoidoscopy and then the people with the highest risk also having a colonoscopy. And when you look at it that way, then, you know, if the triaging was working well, maybe there is not a large difference between these two packages, if you will. Well, in the meantime, uh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo is also uh, present. Uh, Rodrigo, can you unmute and... Did you hear this last answer? No, you're not no longer there anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I have I have a question related to this 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 question actually. Uh, what is the uh, could it also be that there is a difference in the quality of endoscopists between different countries between different centers whatever? Mm, Especially yeah. because we know that the quality of colonoscopy has improved over the years. Very good question, Peter. Yes, there is certainly variation, and we have published that uh, in 2016 in JAMA Internal Medicine with data from this trial, from the Nordic trial, that there was variation in, for example, in ADR uh, between endoscopists in the Nordic trial. Most of the people were far above the, the, the threshold of 20 or 25 percent, depending on, on where you put it. But yes, there was variation, just as you would expect, I think, in any clinical setting. Um, so, and yes, um, maybe. Uh, this variation also translates then into a difference of the protective effect. Um, but we have no chance in the Nordic trial to, uh, to look at this uh, not at 10 years, and we will not be able at 15 years for the simple reason that is that this trial is far too small to look in association of qualities such as ADR and interval cancers. Uh, you remember, you know, Michael Kaminsky's New England Journal paper had, I think, 130,000 colonoscopies. Doug Colley's paper now this summer in JAMA about ADR and colon cancer, colorectal cancer has had 300 and I think 80,000 uh, colonoscopies. We have 13,000 in this trial. Uh, so, so we are we 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 looked at it. There's no there's no signal where we can see, but I think it's because we are far too small 
to, to examine that feature. So, and, and, um, and the last question that was raised by Rodrigo says that, do you think that FIT will have, the, well, FIT-based colonoscopy, uh, I think he means, will have a different outcome? Yeah, I, I don't know. But I, um, I admire um, the Spanish colleagues for their trial where they have the FIT control group. Uh, and there Rodrigo is coming in. So I, I admire what, what, what you and others are doing in Spain, Rodrigo, and I'm looking forward uh, to, the, to the Spanish trial, which as you say, may, may come out next year. Uh, really looking forward to it because that will give us that maybe last piece of the puzzle. How is FIT comparing to colonoscopy? And I am um, looking at the Nordic results. I think, I think maybe it was smart, you know, Peter, for example, for your country, the Netherlands, to 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 um, to start fit screening and probably not colonoscopy screening. Look any of the results, but we will we will see that next year when yeah. when when the Spanish people result, uh, Spanish results are coming. We will see that indeed. Uh, so, so Rodrigo, very 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 well. Hi, I'm sorry to be late. I have so a, a problem with, with my flight. At, Hello. At least, at least you're there. Uh, uh, we heard your commentary. Do you want to comment on what uh, uh, Michael just said? So. Uh, we, hopefully we will have uh, results next next year and yeah, we are even more curious now after the nordic uh, results because uh, i think this is a, a very revolutionary study the, the nordic study and we will we will we will see i i i, I bet for fit at the beginning i i, I bet more for fit uh, now so <laughs> we'll have to see yeah. Because sometimes unexpected things happen, like like Nordic has demonstrated. Absolutely, and uh, yeah. there are also some questions from the audience, uh, uh, Michael, and also uh, of course Rodrigo. Uh, one question is: Can we can we repeat the Nordic uh, trial with a, a AI included, and should we maybe? Yeah, I mean, well, we, yeah, but I think Rodrigo said it in the beginning of his talk, uh, the problem is the control group. We will not have a no screening control group anywhere in the world after this. The a trial comparing colonoscopy with and without AI is actually, you know, our co-panelist Yuichi Mori is just setting up a very large trial to look at, at that one. But a no screening control group, no way that that will happen in the future. I agree with Rodrigo on that. Yeah, so yeah. You, I, you, I, you, I completely you. agree. The, 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 this Nordic trial is, impossible to repeat so that that's give even more value to to that no i think that everyone agrees with that uh yuji can you comment a little bit on the trial that you are working on at the moment yeah the name of the trial is accept and we are including seven countries and also we are including a huge number of participants in this study the question is even if we are able to find some difference in terms of mortality or incidence uh, is it really clinically relevant or something like that? This is a kind of very important question that, that the Michael raised. So we should get focus on uh, clinically uh, uh, meaningful outcome measure or difference in our clinical trials. So we'll see if the trial, uh, which is ongoing in Norway, uh, is uh, really impactful on, uh, on the society or patients. <laughs> right. So, and I think uh, it's, it's almost uh, eight o'clock, uh, but there's, I think, an important question that, that, that needs to be answered, and maybe or you can all answer that, uh, that question. And that uh, question is, according to this study, do you recommend not to perform colonoscopy for uh, CRC screening? I would say anymore. So, and I think that's important because that's also the question that has been raised by many commentators uh, uh, over the last few weeks. Michael, you first. I, my 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 very quick question is, um, it's up to everybody to decide. I think the offer should still be there in the countries that are currently offering it, and then there should be no nudging, no no nudging for people to to come. But everybody should get the absolute risk numbers and, and the absolute effects, and then should decide for themselves. For countries who are currently not doing it, like. Netherlands, I would certainly stick to fit for the moment. I agree. I agree with Rodrigo on that. So, what's your uh, your answer here, uh, Rodrigo? Uh, I, I I agree with Michael. I, I think 
even with uh, some limitation that I, I, I raised, uh, I think the results are quite clear. So as I said before, I, I would stick on, on fit now, but, but we will see the results of the, of the comparative studies because until we don't have uh, trials uh, well designed, we, we, we don't give uh, answers adequately. So Yuji, would you like to comment also maybe for, for well, maybe the situation in Japan or in general? Yeah, uh, in general, as uh, we have to wait for a couple of years before we can find a Spanish study results. So yeah, I'm sorry, I can't have any clear answer on your question, but uh, I'm just looking forward to the Spanish study upcoming next year. Well, I think we're all looking forward to uh, to that next uh, milestone uh, that we uh, that we will have next year. So, uh, Rodrigo, uh, I'm pretty sure you will come back uh, to this uh, paper of the month session again uh, in the near future. And uh, and I like to thank you, Michael and Yuji, and also Rodrigo, and also uh, uh, everyone who was involved in this webinar very much for for making time for this. Uh, I enjoyed it. I think also the audience enjoyed it because they stayed online until the uh, until the end. Thank you very much again for joining and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>